So um, the last time I uh, promised that I will introduce the notion of uh, viscosity solutions. And, uh, I, and uh, today I will start with uh, introducing this notion uh, before going back uh, to our analysis, okay? So I will start by uh, make a very brief uh, introduction of viscosity solutions for those of you who don't uh, uh, who are not familiar with these uh, type of solutions. So, viscosity solutions, I will introduce the notion for first of all the Hamilton-Jacobi equations of uh, this type, so a nonlinear equation which depends on the function u and z, uh, uh, on du and z. But uh, the notion can also be introduced for much more general equations of second order. Actually, I can put u here, it doesn't cost anything. And um, it can also be introduced for second order equations, but here I don't... Uh, need it and uh, I will take a, a, a very simple, uh, um, I will try to introduce it in, a most, uh, in the most simplest way that I can. And um, it is also, of course, uh, it, in the same way, it, is, uh, it also can be introduced for time-dependent problems. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the exact same definition. Here, I will focus on this. And, um, okay, so let's uh, consider um, a very simple equ hamilton jacobi equation, for instance, which is uh, 1 minus gradient of u uh, squared is equal to 0. And this is for z between 0 and 1. And that u is equal to 0 for z equal to 0 or 1. OK? So when we have a Hamilton Jacobi equation, a possibility to uh, find solution, find classical solution, is to use the method of characteristics. OK? But the problem with that is that uh, usually when uh, you have a Hamilton-Jacobi equation, very soon the characteristics will cross and makes that the solution uh, is not smooth anymore. Okay, so uh, in general the solutions are not uh, differentiable for Hamilton-Jacobi equation, at least uh, at some points they are not differentiable. And then the question is how to define a... Um, an appropriate notion of solutions for these equations. We know that classical solutions are not adapted. Well, the notion of weak solutions, in, for instance, in the sense of distributions, is not uh, adapted, adapted neither, because um, this notion is uh, based on the uh, um, integration by parts, and it is adapted to equations that are on divergence form, and uh, this is not the case for Hamilton-Jacobi equations, so we cannot use uh, the notion of weak solution in sub spaces. So there is a need for, uh, for an appropriate uh, notion of solutions. A possibility would be uh, to consider the solutions that uh, verify the Hamilton-Jacobi equation almost everywhere. So the solutions in W1 infinity and uh, which are Lipschitz and uh, they are almost everywhere differentiable and then H of uh, du, u and z is equal to zero almost everywhere. For instance, for this equation, there are uh, many solutions of this type. One can consider 
So the solution has, so this is uh, the axis of Z and this is uh, U. A possibility is to consider, okay, so this is a, uh, um, so the, uh, uh, is, is to consider this, um, uh, this uh, function, maybe I have to put this uh, a better drawing. Yeah, okay. And um, so the steep of these lines is equal to one. So the gradient of u is equal to one on these lines and it is not defined on this point. So this is an option of solution, which is uh, almost everywhere differentiable, but this is not the only one. Actually, there are infinitely many solutions of this type. So we can also consider a solution which is like this, or we can also find solutions like this, And uh, of course, so we can continue and uh, define uh, more and more solutions, which verify the equation almost everywhere. So we see that this is not also uh, an adapted uh, a notion of solution because uh, then there, there's a problem of well uniqueness and well-posedness. So the viscosity solution is defined in a way such that we will only choose one of these options, okay? And um, we will choose one of these options and the one, the one that uh, we can choose here is this one. If I'm not making a um, sign mistake, but we will verify it a little, bit, a little bit later. So this would be uh, the only viscosity solution. And the fact that is that when we have, um, when we write the uh, notion of viscosity solutions, we will see that uh, all the angles which are to the up, they will be forbidden. So all these solutions which have an angle to the up uh, will be forbidden for a viscosity solution. And, um, why do we call it viscosity is that generally if we add a viscosity, a viscosity term and we let epsilon go to zero, we will choose only one of these solutions which is the viscosity solution, okay? So this is why uh, we call this a viscosity solution. So let me give you the definition. So, le so the notion of viscosity solution can be uh, uh, defined for Hamiltonians which are not continuous and uh, also functions which are not continuous, but here I will give the definition in the framework of continuous functions. So I will consider that U is continuous. And I say that U is a viscosity Subsolution if for any test function phi, which is C in C infinity, such that. Uh, u minus phi has a maximum at the point z naught 
we have um, um, that if we replace u by phi in the derivative, we have a sign at the point z naught. Okay? So this is the definition of a viscosity subsolution. So we take any test function phi such that u minus phi ta takes its maximum at the point at naught, and we replace this in this equation, and then we will have a sign, a negative sign. And then in the same way, you will be, uh, we can define a viscosity super solution. So you would be a viscosity super solution. So we can replace this by this. When we define a viscosity super solution, we have to replace, uh, re replace maximum by minimum. And um, this inequality by uh, greater than zero. Okay, so wh what I forgot to say is that while the solution, the, vi the weak solutions of, um, in the distribution sense, for instance, are based on the uh, integration by parts, the viscosity solution, the notion of viscosity solution is defined uh, based on the maximum principle, okay? And um, okay, so and then we, we have a viscosity solution. U is a viscosity solution if it is both. So this is U is U is a viscosity solution if it is both sub and super solution. Okay, and um, a remark that uh, generally helps to uh, to uh, study viscosity solutions and to uh, prove uh, things is that there there are many variants of this uh, definition when we are in uh, considering. Uh, uh, a first order Hamilton Jacobi equation, we can consider also all the test functions that which are in C1. We can replace C infinity by C1. And for the minimum or the maximum point, this could be or not a strict <laughs> local global minimum or maximum points. We, we, so we, all of these definitions would be equivalent. So we can consider a strict maximum, this will give a definition, and non-strict maximum, it's, this gives a definition, and they are both equivalent, okay? And we usually use the one that is more convenient for what we want to do. Um, okay, so this is the definition. Uh, let's see uh, what does it mean uh, for this, okay? So I will show that uh, this uh, solution is a viscosity solution, okay? So first of all, we have uh, chosen these lines to have uh, the derivative u of u equal to 1, so u is a classical solution on these lines, and indeed, if you have a, uh, a classical solution at some point, if you solve the equation in the classical sense, it will also be a viscosity solution, okay? And note that uh, this definition is a very uh, local concept. So we, we have we, the criterion is, uh, is uh, defined in a local way, so we it doesn't really depend on the whole solution. So at each point, we, did we uh, verify if you have a, um, so if the viscosity sol solution criterion is uh, uh, verified or not, okay? 
So here, I say that I have, I mean, on these points, I have a classical solution, so it is a viscosity solution. But it is also easy to show why this is a viscosity solution if it is differentiable. For z, between uh, 0, 1 half and 1 half and 1, we have that 1 minus gradient u squared root uh, s squared of z is equal to 0 in the classical sense. And we take a phi, let's verify, for instance, the sub-solution criterion. We take a phi, which is in infinity, and it has a uh, maximum at the point z. So we want to verify the viscosity criterion at the point z. So we take a test function such that u minus phi has a maximum at this point, and uh, we want to show that one minus gradient of phi squared at the point z is negative or zero. Okay, but the thing is that now we have a smooth functions. U is differentiable phi is differentiable, and u minus phi has a maximum at the point at naught, so we know that u of z, gradient of u of z, is equal to gradient of phi of z, because this is a maximum point, okay? So this is nothing but 1 minus gradient of u squared, which is equal to 0, so it is, of course, negative of zero. And for the same reason, it is also a super solution. So for sure, for all these points, we have a viscosity solution. And it is indeed the proof of the fact that if we are a, visc a, a classical solution, then we are also a viscosity solution. Then the question is, how about this point? OK? Um, so, um, so if we want to verify the viscosity uh, sub-solution criterion, for instance. So we take z equal to 1 half, and we consider a fun test function such that u of z minus phi of z takes its maximum at z equal to 1 half. And uh, something that I forgot to say is that um, another equivalent thing is that you can impose phi. We can choose phi such that u of z is equal to phi of z. Okay, so we can uh, translate things such that uh, um, u and phi have the same value at this point, and this is a still equivalent definition. Um, as is z not, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. so, thank you. So at this point that we are uh, trying to show that we have a viscosity solution or not, we can take, uh, we can restrict the, the set of test functions to the ones that they touch the solution u, u at that point. And it doesn't change anything, it's like, uh, because, uh, um, it's like uh, adding a constant to phi, and in the derivative, it will not change anything, okay? Okay, so if u minus phi takes a max maximum, it means that the, the gra graph of u has to be uh, below the graph of phi, okay? So phi has to be something that is uh, above this function u, because then u minus phi is negative here and 0 there. But we want some function phi which is smooth. And of course, this is not possible. Okay, So there is no function phi which is smooth and it's, uh, it is, which is above the function u. Okay, so 
there does not exist such a test function. OK, so we, we said that we should verify that for any test function such that we have to verify a criterion. Now there is no test function. So it is immediately a viscosity sub-solution. Sub OK. So, the viscosity subsolution criterion is uh, verified immediately. And what about the super solution criterion? So now we have to take a f test function phi such that it takes its minimum. at z equal to one half, okay? So we have, this time, we have to put a um, function, a, a smooth function, below the function u. And this time it is possible. It is possible, but there are some restrictions. So we see that the derivative of phi, phi would be, so the tangent line is this one, and the tangent line has to be between these two lines, okay? So the tangent line to phi has to be between these two lines, and this means that gradient of phi has to be uh, less than one. Okay, and uh, so we can rewrite this in terms of the equation, and this will give that minus gradient of phi squared at the point one half is positive or zero, which is the criterion that we were looking for for the viscosity super solution. Okay, so we have a viscosity super solution. So this is indeed a viscosity super solution. And uh, what remains to do is that to see why the angles to the up are not a viscosity, super, uh, viscosity solution. So we can uh, um, uh, guess which one of them would uh, cause a problem because as before, in one of the, uh, one of the uh, criterion, there is no test function because we cannot put a, a smooth function below the function u here. And uh, so the viscosity super solution criterion is verified automatically, okay? So it is for sure a viscosity super solution. But now, why isn't it a viscosity sub solution? To, to see that, we have to put a function phi above this function and for the same reason we will have that the tangent line is between uh, these two lines so gradient of phi at the point z uh, at the point one half here is bit is less than one and we have minus gradient of phi squared is greater than zero so of course, if it is equal to one, this is not a problem, but we choose a test function which is strictly less than one, its derivative is strictly less than one. 
and this will give this, this inequality, which has the opposite sign to what we are looking for. Okay, so this is not a viscosity subsolution. Okay, so we see that this definition allows us to choose one, only one solution between this infinitely many solutions. Okay, and uh, generally it's a, it's a notion for which um, there are many results of well-posedness for different types of uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equations under uh, some reasonable assumptions. And um, okay, so this is um, a, a convenient notion for this type of equations. And um, some property that, that it has its stability. So it, uh, these type of solutions are very stable with respect to, in particular, adding a viscosity term to the equation. So you can add a viscosity term to the equation, and then because of the viscosity term, viscosity term, you have smooth solutions. And then you let epsilon go to zero, and you will converge to the viscosity solution. OK, so we will see this uh, in the context of uh, the problem that we were studying. And uh, I will show it uh, in that uh, particular example. but. Uh, this is uh, actually uh, the, uh, uh, we s it allows to, sh to see why we have this stability. Okay, so before doing that, so I'm, I, I will now go back to the, to the problem that we had uh, studied on Wednesday. So just uh, a reminder of what we did. So we had uh, some equation. Um, so we began with uh, some equation of, uh, okay, maybe I will uh, just uh, uh, skip some parts and say that we had some equation which was written like this. So there's uh, epsilon c, epsilon squared, d2, dz squared, and epsilon. And this was equal to an epsilon r of z minus capital N epsilon with capital N epsilon equal to an epsilon of z dz. Okay? And we had obtained this equation as the long time uh, behavior of the solution of the po of the population density of a popula uh, of a density of a population which is subject to mutations and selection and competition and uh, and subject to an environment change a, an environment which was moving with a constant speed so if so what is what was this behind this was that we were at the beginning considering some growth rates R such that we took this uh, um, and the variable we had Z minus CT, which means that the profile of the growth rate was moving uh, to the right. Okay, so this was R, and then at a time R of at the, at the point uh, z minus ct not, and then at the point c at the point t, r would be uh, would have the same profile but shifted to the right. And with some change of variables, we uh, transfer this ct to the equation to the derivative term to a drift term, and we obtain this equation. And our objective was to to study this equation for epsilon small. And um, what we did is that we used the half call transformation 
that was to write an epsilon equal uh, 1 over square root of 2 p epsilon exponential of u epsilon over epsilon and this would lead to this equation Okay, and uh, okay, so there's a u here instead of n. And then what we said is that a u would converge. Uh, oh, I have to put my. Uh, uh, <coughs> maybe I'll put this because uh, otherwise it will do it all the time. Um, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so starting from this equation, we, we obtained that, um, okay, I didn't prepare my uh, tag actually. <laughs> I forgot to do many things. Okay. Um, okay, so, we had this equation that I have written here, and then we, we said that uh, uh, this u epsilon would converge to this Hamilton Jacobi equation in the viscosity sense. Okay, how do we prove such a, such a thing? Um, so, first of all, um, we need some regularity estimates to say that u epsilon converges to some function u. Which is continuous locally uniformly. Okay? I will not talk about uh, how we obtain those regularity estimates, but there are some estimates, Lipschitz estimates, that allow us to use the Arzela Scoli theorem to, to have this convergence property. But let's, say, let's assume that we know this, and let's see now why the solution would be a viscosity solution, which is actually related to this stability property of viscosity solutions. Okay, so I will do it for the sub-solution criterion, but it, is, uh, it would work the same for the sub-super solution. Okay, so if we want to prove that U is a viscosity sub-solution to this equation, so we have to take to consider all test functions phi such that u minus phi, for instance, we are verifying at a arbitrary point z, z not, and uh, u minus phi has a, and I will use the strict one, strict uh, maximum at the point uh, Z naught. And I want to prove that. So I need to prove that for the viscosity subsolution criterion to hold, Okay, something that I forgot to say is that an epsilon converges also to a constant and not. Um, of course, an epsilon is a constant, and uh, it's, if it is bounded, we know that it converges along subsequences, and all these convergences are along subsequences, okay? But we, we assume that we have these properties, and we prove the viscosity criterion. So we want to prove this. 
And how we do it, we see that, uh, okay, u minus phi has a strict maximum at that knot, and I know that u epsilon minus phi converge locally, uniformly, <coughs> to u minus phi. And this will imply that there exists a sequence z epsilon such that z epsilon goes to z naught and u epsilon minus z epsilon has a maximum at z, z epsilon, okay? So this is something that this comes from the uniform uh, convergence of u epsilon, and I'm using also that this, the, the maximum is strict, and uh, you can verify as an exercise that uh, this is true, that uh, there exists a sequence z epsilon such that z epsilon goes to z zero, and that z epsilon, u epsilon minus phi, sorry, has a maximum at z epsilon. Okay, now I will use the equation on u epsilon. Okay? I will use the equation on u epsilon, which is this one. Let's go back to this. So I know that this is true. I will evaluate it at z epsilon. Okay? And I use the fact that u epsilon minus phi has a maximum at z epsilon. And also you, I use the fact that, well, this equation is hold in a classical way and sense, and u epsilon is smooth as well, okay? So u epsilon has a real second derivative. And since we have a maximum point at z epsilon, we can obtain that dz u epsilon at the point z epsilon is equal to dz phi at the point z epsilon, okay? And that dz second derivative u epsilon over z, so u epsilon minus phi is, has a maximum, so this is concave around the point z epsilon, so its second derivative has to be negative, okay? So it has to be negative Okay, uh, which means that uh, minus epsilon dzzu epsilon is greater than minus epsilon d phi phi, dzz phi. So I write here the conclusions in terms of phi. So this is epsilon. And now, because here I had a greater than zero, um, okay, so I am making, uh, um, so I'm taking a maximum, so I need this to be negative, so uh, am I doing a problem with the sign? No, no, uh, so it, it's, it's, it would be, so minus epsilon uh, phi phi would be less than this, so we will, I will have less than or equal, of R of Z epsilon minus kappa and epsilon minus C2 C squared over 4. Okay? So now I have an inequality in terms of phi, which is uh, which it does not depend on epsilon. So this is a mistake. Okay? And I let epsilon go to zero. So now phi is fixed, 
and that epsilon goes to, to Z naught, and I have an epsilon in front of this term, so this term will dis disappear, and I will obtain this inequality. Okay, and this is the viscosity subsolution criterion. So in this way, we have shown that U is indeed a viscosity subsolution, and similarly, one can prove that it is a viscosity supersolution, so it is a viscosity solution, okay? Okay, so, so this is what I wanted to say about uh, these viscosity solutions. So we saw last time that we can actually solve this equation and uh, show that in this particular case, the solution is indeed a smooth. So what, I don't think that I will have time to, to develop the proof of this if I want to go a little bit further to the uh, uh, next sections. Um, but uh, just a remark is that such type of equations is not, um, I mean the uniqueness of this type of equation is not uh, straightforward. We are using several things. The first thing is that the maximum of u is equal to zero, so this is important uh, uh, constraint to have uniqueness. But we are also using the fact that uh, th these assumptions that we made on R um, which is um, we assume that R has a unique maximum at the point Zm and there exists a unique point Z bar at the left of Zm such that we have uh, this difference of C squared over 4 for R at those points, okay? So these assumptions are necessary to have uh, this uniqueness property and uh, and the identification of the solution as we did, uh, as we obtain. Okay? So this is indeed uh, the main ingredients of this proof, but I will skip. But they are on my slides. And then, as you saw, is that, uh, well, the conclusion was that uh, once we know U, then we can identify N, uh, the limit of an epsilon, as a Dirac mass. Okay. Now, okay. Now let's go back. Uh, so, so let's now start the second section, which is the case of periodic environment. And um, I uh, go back to this uh, motivation that I showed uh, in this. Uh, in my first lecture. So maybe just a um, small reminder. So we had this uh, uh, experiment of biologists which had studied a, bio a population of bacteria um, and they had actually two copies of these populations which were genetically identically, uh, identical initially and they put them in two different environments in a periodic environment and in a constant environment, so uh, where the temperature was equal to 31, and uh, in the second one, we had a daily uh, periodic uh, change of temperature. So this was constant 31, and this was the environment which was periodic temperature with uh, average uh, 31. Okay? So we had these populations that evolved in these two different environments for a long time, and then they sampled these populations and they put them in different environments. For instance, in temperature 24, 31, and 38. And they measured their growth rates, each of the populations, and they thaw, saw that the population that had evolved in the periodic environment was more performant than the population that had evolved in the constant environment. 
And uh, even at the temperature 31, uh, which was the original temperature uh, environment uh, of uh, this population. And uh, this was at, at least at the first glance a little bit surprising because we, you could expect that a population that evolves for a long time in a certain environment, it would be uh, the most adapted to this <coughs> environment. But here we made them evolve in another environment and then they became more performant even for this particular environment. So, and we were wondering if uh, there exists a pos, I mean, we can see such a phenomenon also by a mathematical model, okay? And uh, more generally, to understand the imp impact of oscillations of the environment on a population. Okay, so um, let's uh, start with the model. So here we have, um, uh, an equation of similar type uh, as before. The difference is that uh, the last time we had uh, that the population, uh, the growth rate was uh, shifting to the right. In this case, this is not shifting, but it is oscillating, okay, in a periodic way. And uh, as before, we can uh, give the example of quadratic growth rate where we have uh, uh, this maximal growth rate, little r, the optimal trait theta of E and uh, the selection pressure S of E, which uh, determines how uh, uh, fast the population grows, the, the growth rate uh, because becomes non-optimal when we go uh, far from the uh, optimal trait, okay? So, but then in this case, we could uh, uh, let these function, uh, these constants of the, the model to, to oscillate in a periodic way, okay? But this is an example, but uh, we can analyze the problem uh, in a more, more general framework. And uh, the assumptions that we make is that the function R is smooth and it is bounded from above. And we also make this uh, um, notation, which is R bar of Z is the average of R over a period. And we assume that there exists a unique maximum point Zm for this average function. So R bar of Z is equal to one over T integral of R of E of T Z dt. So T, uh, capital T is the period. And we assume that the maximum of R bar is attained at the unique, unique point Zm. Okay? Now, how can we study uh, this uh, problem? So first we introduce an eigenvalue problem, uh, which this time is a flock a a eigenvalue uh, because we have this dependence on time and uh, the periodic condition, okay? So if R goes to minus infinity at infinity, then we still have a compact operator, uh, uh, an operator with compact resolvent, and we can show by the crane rothman theorem that there exists a unique uh, principal eigen, uh, fun uh, eigen pair such that the corresponding eigen function doesn't change sign, okay? And uh, actually, we can also relax this assumption to consider bounded growth rates, but we need some assumptions that R is not is small enough at infinity but uh, I'm not going to de detail that. Okay. Um, so under these assumptions, then we can show that uh, similarly to what we had the last time, that if this, funct this uh, uh, eigenvalue is positive, then the total size of the population goes to zero. And if not, 
then the solution, uh, the population uh, survives and there is no extinction. And then at infinity, it converges to a uh, positive function in P sigma, which is now the solution uh, to this periodic equation. So it's the same equation as from the beginning, but now the solution becomes periodic. So if you wait for a long time, the solution uh, becomes periodic. And, uh, uh, and the, uh, of course, the uh, proof is based on the, this uh, eigen, uh, eigenvalue problem. And we can prove that uh, a normalized version of the uh, function n would converge to this, uh, um, sorry, to this uh, eigenvector, principal eigenvector p. Okay, and uh, and uh, with a similar uh, argument as uh, the last time, we can prove that if the eigenvector, uh, if the eigenvalue has a positive sign, then the population size goes to zero, but otherwise it remains positive. But this time it will converge to a periodic function, which solves this uh, equation. Sorry. Okay, je sais pas. Okay, en train d'utiliser mauvais. So it goes to this um, periodic function where Q sigma is uh, defined in this way by averaging R uh, with respect to the eigenvector. Okay, eigenfunction. So, so we know that if we wait for a long time, the solution uh, would be uh, uh, periodic and it will solve the same equation. And then the question is again, how to describe and how to characterize this periodic solution. And because we cannot do it in a, in a general uh, context, we make some assumptions that the mutations have a small effects. And um, we try to characterize the solution to uh, this equation. So that I write here. So P is for periodic. So okay, I have to write P epsilon to be uh, in agreement with my notations. P epsilon, R of E and Z minus kappa, capital N epsilon. And this capital and epsilon is again, so NP epsilon, the integral of NP epsilon dz. And we have this uh, periodic uh, boundary condition. Okay. So we have this equation and we try to uh, describe uh, uh, its solution under the assumption that I actually just realized that I had kept this. <laughs> so it would be easier like this. <coughs> okay, so if uh, uh, so we want to describe the solution of this equation. And, um, okay, so I had shown that the function NP sigma, sorry, NP sigma was the solution to this uh, equation. Now the only difference that is uh, we replace sigma by uh, epsilon with epsilon small parameter. And this uh, Q sigma was given by this. So first of all, we can pass to the limit in this equation. And it will give us uh, an equation on P, on N, capital N, which will uh, solve this uh, logistic equation. And um, so 
if we define capital NP to be the unique solution to this, then we can prove that NP epsilon indeed converge to this function. And little n p epsilon, which is the population density, would converge to Dirac mass that is at the point Zm. And I recall that the point Zm is the maximum point of R, uh, R bar. Okay? So it's the maximum point of R bar. So uh, as epsilon goes to zero, the population would concentrate around the point which maximizes an average environment uh, with average growth rate R bar. Okay? And um, so to do this, we can follow the same uh, uh, type of arguments and uh, um, use the Hofkel transformation. And uh, so we write, uh, we put uh, the half cost transformation in the equation on NP epsilon. And uh, this will give us an equation on U epsilon, which is this one. Uh, uh, U epsilon. And here we will have a gradient of z uh, u epsilon squared plus r of ez minus kappa n epsilon. And again, we use these ansets that u epsilon is equal to, so it depends on t and z this time. So we, put, we use these ansets that u epsilon is equal to some function u, which is a smooth. <coughs> plus smaller terms, okay? And uh, so if you remember, the whole idea of the approach was that we have a concentration which is singular, so we at the limit, we have a singular limit, and to avoid the singular limit, we make the half cold transformation, and we, we work with this logarithmic, uh, uh, the function obtained from the half cold transformation, and its advantage is that this would be much smoother than the first one, and we would expect such type of uh, um, asymptotic expansions. And uh, we put this in an equation, and we look at the terms which have the same order in epsilon, okay? So we put this in the equation, and uh, we see, uh, we, uh, we gather all the terms which are of the same order in epsilon. So a first term would be a term with order epsilon minus one, and this will give us one over epsilon dTU of T and Z. And this is the only term which is of this order. So we put this equal to zero, which would, um, so uh, I don't put uh, the one over epsilon, but the one over epsilon is in front of this. This is the only term of this order so we would expect that if the limit exists, then u wouldn't depend on t. So it, this would imply that u of t and z is indeed uh, equal to uh, u of z, okay? So it doesn't depend on t. And then we go to the next orders to, 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 to know more. So maybe I will keep this one. Oh, actually, I, I can use the... Uh, okay. So um, then we look at the terms of order zero, and this will give us dt of v, um, the term with second derivative doesn't have any term of order zero, and then we will have gradient of z of u 
squared plus r of e and z. And we will also assume that we have an asymptotic expansion for n, the capital N. Okay, so this was n p epsilon. We assume that this is equal to n zero plus uh, epsilon uh, k, uh, epsilon, uh, let's say m. Okay. So, and of and because we have a periodic, uh, because a u epsilon is periodic, we will assume that all these expansions are also periodic. So we will assume that u and v are periodic. Okay. And now we will. So we know that u doesn't depend on t. Yeah? Okay. So this is just a function of z, and um, okay, n zero uh, may depend on t. So maybe I don't put the zero just to remember. I I don't know which. Uh, yeah, I had used n p to say that it is a periodic function. Okay. So what we do is that we. Make an integ we integrate this function, this equality, with respect to time over a period of time, and we make an average on this. Because v is a periodic function, this will be give a zero. And at the right, we will have dz u squared, because this doesn't depend on t, on z, but this depends on t. But if we take an average of this, this will give us r bar, the function r bar that we define. Okay? So this would be uh, r bar of z plus minus kappa some average of this np. Okay? And this is uh, uh, that I will call n bar. Okay, so this gives us the hamilton jacobi equation. And this is why, so this is at least uh, how formally we obtain uh, this hamilton jacobi equation, and we can indeed prove rigorously that the function up epsilon would converge locally uniformly to the viscosity solution of this hamilton jacobi equation. And just a remark about viscosity solution, you have to be very careful uh, on how you write your equation. Um, minus dz u squared equal to something is not the same equation than dz u squared equal to minus that quantity. So this, the, the sign uh, 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 with which you write the equation is, uh, changes the notion of viscosity solution, okay? So, the minus is really important there. Okay, and this is something that you can already see uh, with the example that I showed you at the beginning, because if you put uh, everything with a minus sign in front of it, then you will choose the function that, uh, the solution that had the uh, angle to the up, not the, not the bottom. Okay, so, so we can prove that u, epsilon, u p epsilon converges locally uniformly to this function. Uh, and that um, we ha still have this maximum uh, of u equal to zero, uh, which, uh, which is still related to, this, uh, to the fact that n p epsilon is bounded below and above by, above by positive constants. Okay? And this relation between the limit of n, n and u here, if we divide np epsilon by, its, by the total size, it will converge in the sense of measures to some measure fp, which has its support in the, function, in the set of zero points of u. Okay, so it's a result which is very close to the one that we had in the first part. Um, okay, so uh, of course uh, the analysis uh, and all the regularity estimates and, st uh, and stuff uh, would change because of the periodic uh, uh, condition. 
But uh, since I'm not uh, talking about those paths, uh, it is very close. And um, in this case as well, we can uh, show that we can identify, we can show, yes? Yes? Uh, okay, capital NP of epsilon is uh, the function that verifies this. Oh, sorry. Okay, capital NP is the solution of this function, this, this equation. Um, so the real, um, what is really related to you is where the Dirac mass is, okay? So what uh, is directly directed to you is that the maximum points of view determine where the, the support of the solution is concentrated on. But this also has an influence on the size of the population, which is capital NP. And it appears in this. Because once we know that, okay, the maximum of you was at point ZM, then the, po the population is concentrated at the point ZM. So this is why we have this growth rate which appears in this logistic equation, okay? So it's indirect. Okay. So, um, okay, so we, uh, okay, see, so I will say. Um, the uh, function u can be identified uh, here as well, and it is a, still a smooth function which takes its maximum at the point ZM. So since it's the unique maximum point of view, the support of N is equal to this point. So N has to be a Dirac mass at this point. Okay? And then we can uh, go further, um, at, at least if uh, formally uh, we can uh, assume that we have enough regularity, then we can go further and estimate some quantities and, um, and obtain some analytic estimates on the moments of the population distribution. So we can, uh, so I, I introduced these notations where NP epsilon bar is the average size of the population. And uh, then we have the mean phenotypic trait and its average over time. And the mean variance uh, phenotypic variance of the population, which is given by this formula. So it's just defining the mean and the uh, variance of a distribution. But this time I also introduce a new uh, notion, which is the mean fitness of the population when it is uh, kept in an environment at stated bar. Uh, so why I am interested in this quantity? Because this is close to what was measured in the experiment. Okay? So and it is given by this integral term. So we say that we have put the population at the, at the state E bar. So the growth rate of traits Z, trait Z is given by R of E bar Z. And this is multiplied by the, um, the proportion of the population, which is of size of, of trait Z, Z, okay? And this will give us uh, the average uh, fitness, mean fitness of the, uh, of the population. Okay, and we will see uh, what we can obtain on these quantities. So a first case is that, uh, okay, we will make the classical, we, co we consider the classical uh, um, example which has been studied a lot in uh, in particular in the biological literature, where we have a quadratic function and the only parameter that changes is, uh, is the uh, optimal trait. But actually, they didn't even consider uh, uh, the most general form of this. They just cons had considered sinusoid functions. Okay? So these are the functions. So the uh, function R is a quadratic term. But depending on the state of the environment, its growth rate, its optimal trait moves. Okay? And if we define these quantities theta bar and V theta, which are uh, the average of theta, uh, the optimal trait over a period, 
And this quantity that can be uh, considered as the uh, optimal, as the, uh, I'm sorry, as the variance, as, as, the, as uh, the variance of the optimal frame. Okay, and we see what are the uh, uh, effect of these terms. So, so these terms, are which are the quantities that appear naturally in the formula, and we obtain that the average size of the population is given by this, uh, is estimated by these terms. So the, uh, so in the first uh, case with the shifting environment, we already have this, so this is little r, the r max is little r, and uh, epsilon square root of s is the mutation load. What is added is this term, which, is, which comes from the fluctuations, and this is the effect of the fluctuations on the population size, which we see that it is negative, and uh, V theta was the variance of the uh, optimal trait. So we see that if we, of course, if there was not, uh, there was no change in the environment, this would have been zero. But uh, as as long as there is a variance of the uh, the optimal trait, this will have a negative effect on the population size. We can also compute these uh, mean, phenotype, mean phenotype and uh, variance, phenotypic variance. And um, in particular, for the mean phenotype, we will have the mean phenotype at the first, at the, uh, at the first order will be uh, uh, concentrated at the point theta bar, which is the average uh, of theta. Okay, so this is this average. But then, there are some fluctuations of order epsilon, which are um, periodic. And in the particular example, where we take uh, E of t to be a sinusoid function, then mu p epsilon would be uh, given by this, where we see that we have the same frequency for the sinusoid function, but with a delay. So it again says that, okay, the population tries to go towards the optimal trait, but it is, there's a still a lag, there's a delay uh, in that. And of course, uh, with the also <coughs> a much smaller uh, amplitude. Okay, so this is what we see uh, uh, in the figures as well. Um, in particular, this is uh, in the red is the optimal trait and mu is the, and in blue is the mean phenotype and we see that, okay, we try to go into the direction of the change of the optimal trait, but uh, we cannot, uh, we, we always have, uh, I mean, smaller ampli amplitude, but also a delay to, uh, uh, to go in the right direction. Okay, and um, so, now how about the quantity that was uh, our uh, first motivation, which is the mean fitness. What can we say on the mean fitness? When uh, the population is uh, placed at an environment E, E bar, and um, so what we see is that, okay, the mean fitness is given by R minus epsilon square root of S minus this term, and this term comes from the fluctuations, okay? So if we didn't have any fluctuations, we would have only the blue terms, but because of the fluctuations, we have this term, which is a negative term, and this is the load due to the maladaptation. Because the optimal trait changes constantly, the population is always uh, maladapted, and uh, because of this maladaptation, there's a load in the, mean in, fit in the mean fitness of the population. Uh, okay, and um, if we compare this with the um, the um, mean fitness of a population that had evolved in a constant environment, we don't have this negative term. So what we obtain is that, okay, so the fluctuations of the optimal trait are always uh, negative. They, I mean, they have a negative effect. And the uh, phenomenon that was observed in the biological experiment cannot be observed by this model. Okay, so we cannot have a, uh, the population that has evolved in a periodic environment, now we place it at the constant environment because the, uh, there are many, uh, I mean, there are more variety in the population, uh, it is not adapted and uh, there is a maladaptation and um, 
it has a negative term, okay? So, now we will consider a different situation where we say that, okay, now we consider that the um, fluctuations will act, will influence another parameter, which is uh, the strength of selection, okay? So, the, S, the optimal trait now is always equal to zero, but uh, the strength of selection is different in different environments. So, uh, different colors here correspond to different environment states, and we see that uh, depending on the type of on the environment, we will have a, 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 now a narrower or a flatter curve around the, uh, the optimal trait. Okay? And now we will try to compute the same type of quantities. And to do that, the, uh, the, there is this um, S bar which will, be, will appear naturally, uh, which is the mean, uh, um, the average uh, strength of selection. Okay? Okay. So, um, so the size of the population will be uh, given by this. Uh, quantity, which is R max minus epsilon square root of S bar. So the mutation load now depends on uh, this average strength of selection. And now if we compare it with the uh, population which has evolved in a constant environment of R, we have to compare it by, with uh, a formula where we have instead of S bar, we have S of E bar, S of E, okay? And we see now that it is not clear that uh, this has always a negative effect because depending whether on uh, uh, depending on whether S bar is less than or greater than S of E bar, this would increase or decrease the population size. Okay, so this is not uh, always a negative effect. It could be also a positive effect if, in average, we uh, we um, uh, the strength of selection is smaller, then the population size will be greater. Okay? And then we can also compute the next orders with some moments. But uh, let me go to the uh, case of uh, mean fitness. And um, so the mean fitness of the population which has evolved in a periodic environment, when, but it has been placed at this environment E bar, is given by this formula. And um, uh, it can be, so this is uh, R minus S epsilon S of E bar, so strength of selection at the state E bar over uh, square root of S bar, which is bar the average S. And now we have to uh, compare this term with, by, with this term, which is the mean fitness of the population evolved in the constant environment, E bar, which is just my, from, so the, um, uh, the red term is minus epsilon square root of S, S of E bar. Okay? So again, we see that it is not uh, always the case that one of them is better than the other. It depends on whether S bar is greater than S of E bar or is it is less than it. And uh, depending on that, the fluctuations of the pre selection pressure may increase or decrease the mean fitness of the population. And in particular here, it's uh, if S bar is greater than S of E bar, if we, in average, we select more strongly than in the constant environment, then the effect is positive on that. Okay, so the mean fitness will be better because, so this is uh, actually uh, uh, mm, uh, finally very intuitive because if we select an average more strongly, it means that the population is an, has a narrower distribution, so the population is more close to the optimal trait, so it will grow better. Okay? So this is a something that may explain the experiment. Of course, if you want to really know uh, if this is what happens in the experiment, you have to go to the, you have to do to run more experiments and, uh, and, and test this hypothesis. And pr probably uh, what happens is that uh, there's a mixture of uh, these effects on, uh, on the optimal trait and the, um, 
uh, on the pressure of the selection and maybe on other parameters of the model as well. Okay, but at least it gives a, an example where we see also by the mathematical model that uh, we can uh, obtain such type of phenomena. Okay? Um, so, okay, so I, uh, then uh, in the third section we will uh, mix this shifting and oscillating environment and I will go very fast actually, I'm just, so this was, I mean just uh, to say that uh, um, motivation of that is for instance to consider the temperature, the increase of temperature on earth that it is uh, gradually uh, becoming uh, um, higher and higher and uh, but there's also fluctuations and periodic oscillations because of the seasonal effects and um, so we can also look at situations where the growth rate uh, has a periodic component so it, ha it oscillates periodically but we also have this uh, um, shift in the environment and then Okay, so we can uh, provide an analysis of this problem as well. I'm not going to the details of the analysis, but it's somehow uh, coupling um, the ideas that uh, we had in the first two sections. And just uh, to give uh, the final results where we have on the interpretation biological interpretations that uh, might be obtained on the moments of the population distribution. So on the uh, uh, mean phenotype, mean the variance and the uh, size of the population. So I'm not going to compute the uh, mean fitness this time. And um, so here, so we can uh, see uh, uh, the formula that gives us the total population size in average the mean phenotypic trait, the variance, and the speed of uh, the threshold for the speed above which the population will go extinct. Okay? So, um, so the, the red, I mean, when we have the blue, is the blue terms correspond to, the, to what we had only with fluctuations. And when we add a shift in the environment, we will have some additional terms. Uh, because of this shift that is a load in the population size and the lag in the phenotype, a mean phenotype because of this. So I, what I would like to comment is this uh, speed of the environment change. Um, so we see that this critical speed uh, decreases with V theta. So V theta was the uh, variance of the uh, optimal trait, okay? Variance in the fluctuations of the optimal trait. And we see that this critical speed is a decreasing function of that. And uh, this means that if, so the, the fluctuations have a negative effect in this situation on this um, critical speed of survival uh, because they make it lower. So it means that with a smaller speed, uh, chain, chain, uh, uh, um, speed of change of the environment, the population could go, could go to extinct. Okay? So, uh, and this is because these uh, fluctuations on the optimal trait always add some maladaptation to the population and it, it is uh, always a negative uh, effect also for the population's ability to follow the environment, environment shift. And now we consider the situation where uh, the fluctuations are on the pressure of the selection. And um, we introduce again this S bar to be average of S. And uh, then we can compute these uh, uh, quantities. And um, again I will only uh, comment and this speed of, uh, the threshold for the speed of environmental shift. And it has to be compared with the formula where we, instead of a spar, we will have S of E bar. Okay, S of, the value of S at uh, a certain environment E bar with constant uh, state. 
And now we see that the uh, effect is not always negative, and it again depends on the sign of and the uh, relation between S bar and S of E bar. And uh, if S bar is greater than S of E bar, then the speed of the environment, the, the critical speed will, uh, sorry, will uh, decay. So, uh, but if S bar is less than S of E bar, then uh, the critical speed uh, increases. So it becomes easier for the population to follow the environment change. So we see that uh, depending on this relation, these fluctuations <coughs> may uh, be or may not be uh, benefic for the population to follow this environmental shift. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, in the, um, uh, I think it remains 30 minutes. Okay. So, in the remaining uh, time, uh, I will um, try to introduce another type of scaling. So, as I said in, at the end of my lecture uh, on Wednesday, um, so there is an important assumption on what uh, all we did is that uh, we, uh, there are some scaling assumptions which may be very important in the outcome and in the qualitative behavior that we obtain at the end. And now we will see an example where actually uh, we see a big difference. Uh, and uh, to do that, we will consider now a totally different environment change where we have a, a piecewise constant environment. Uh, where so we the state of environments remained for a long time at some state and then we have a jump to another state and we will assume that this jump occurs uh, slowly so it's not uh, very fast so we can consider as uh, many uh, uh, I mean the analysis works for um, general piecewise constant environment but let's consider a simple case where we have just two states. And uh, let's also consider it periodic, just to be able to compare it with the uh, periodic case that we saw. But it is not important in the analysis. So we will consider this environment where, which switches between E1 and E2. And when we are between 0 and 80, we are in state E1. And then we have a switch to the state E2. Okay, um, so we will use the same type of equation, so of model for, uh, to study this. Uh, okay, so, yeah, okay, so let's forget about this epsilon for the moment. I have been too fast in my slide. <coughs> so just, uh, okay, so I think that there's some slides missing. <laughs> Uh, okay. So the um, let's consider what I write on the board instead of this. So we will just consider d over dt of n minus sigma Laplacian of n times n r of e of t and z minus kappa n. Okay, with capital N always the size of the population, okay? So we have the uh, same type of equation as before. And um, in the previous works, uh, we had this scaling that we considered sigma equal to epsilon squared with epsilon less than one. And uh, I mean, epsilon very small. And um, the order of uh, the uh, fluctuations, the period of the fluctuations was of order one. So we had a small genetic variance. So the uh, evolutionary time scale was slow because we had a small genetic variance. But the period of fluctuations was of order one. And uh, this made that the population did not have the time to adapt to the different states of the environment, but uh, it would adapt to an average 
state of the environment. Okay? And uh, the average uh, was, uh, could be given by this uh, function R bar. Uh, so this is the average growth rate, and this was the quantity that was uh, appearing in this case. So we have A times R of E1Z plus 1 minus A R of E2Z, which is the average uh, growth rate. And then the population would concentrate on the point ZM, which maximized, uh, maximized this function R bar, this average growth rate R bar. And we had, uh, okay, so a periodic size of the, uh, the population because of the fluctuations, but concentration at this point ZM, which is the best rate in an average environment, okay? Now let's consider a different scaling where um, this period of fluctuations is large and it is of order one over epsilon. Okay, so it, we will take it to be t tilde over epsilon, which means that, uh, okay, we stay for a long time in state E1 before going to the state E2. Uh, and s because of this, uh, we will have the time to adapt to environment state, okay? And um, so because now we have uh, a slow environment change, we will make a, a change of variable to have a period of order one. So E tilde will be E of epsilon t and the period of E tilde would be of, of order one, okay? And we we also uh, change this, the, um, the scale of time. We replace t by t over epsilon to follow the uh, evolutionary uh, uh, dynamics of the population. And this will give us this equation on, an, uh, on this uh, renormalized uh, function, which is called an epsilon tilde which is given by this equation. Okay, so um, just um, be careful that in the other, uh, in the uh, previous models that we have studied, we didn't have any epsilon here. What we did is that we let first t go to infinity to see in long time what is the population, what is the behavior of the population in CD, and then we let epsilon go to zero. Here we are doing something else. Uh, we are letting t to replacing t by t over epsilon, and we will study the transitory dynamics, which will be of order t over epsilon because we have a small um, uh, evolutionary dynamics. Okay, and then um, so we can uh, still uh, make. Uh, so you see that um, uh, these last uh, slides, uh, there are many typos in them. So <laughs> here we have a t in the variables. So uh, we uh, make again the Hofkoff transformation and we try to see uh, what we obtain at the limit, okay? So if we put this in the equation on an epsilon, So I will do it uh, fast. This will give us this new equation where now we keep a dt of u epsilon, which was not before in the equation. Uh, plus R of E of Z and this, there's a minus kappa in epsilon here. Okay, and um, 
we uh, can pass to the limit in this equation, again in the viscosity sense, and we would obtain this Hamilton Jacobi equation. Okay? And um, so we can prove indeed uh, a result which is similar to the previous results, but this time the Hamilton Jacobi equation is a time dependent Hamilton Jacobi equation. Uh, and we still have this maximum of u equal to zero. Okay, just um, a small remarks to understand better why we are doing, uh, um, I mean, w of course different uh, scalings are possible and uh, depending on the, t uh, the, the uh, question that you have in mind. This um, scaling t over epsilon allows you to, to follow uh, the transitive dynamics of the population, while at the beginning we studied the long time behavior. Okay, so we are, we are uh, here um, studying the transitive dynamics, but it also gives an idea on what we will have at the end. Okay, but we could have done also the scaling for the first problems, it's just that it would have told us how we evolve uh, before, go, uh, before that uh, long time behavior. Okay. So, uh, so at the limit, we have a Hamilton-Jacobi equation with constraint, and uh, the solution of this Hamilton-Jacobi equation with constraint is related to the, the, me the uh, measure that we obtain for the phenotypic density at the limit, with this uh, relation sup of n is included in the zeros of u. And this type of derivations have been uh, actually uh, uh, the first results that uh, appeared in the, on the Hamilton-Jacobi approach, okay? So the Hamilton-Jacobi approach started with this scaling and uh, for these type of problems, but with a more general type of uh, competition term, okay? But uh, just for simplicity uh, in the talk, I, I took a logistic term, but you can uh, consider uh, more complex uh, competition terms. But these derivations were all, uh, uh, they were based on some strong assumption that would uh, ensure that the population would not get extinct, okay? So if we are sure that we are in a framework that initially uh, the population is uh, well adapted enough or the population growth rate is, I mean, the, the, uh, the, tra the growth rates of the individuals is positive everywhere. In these type of situations, we know that the population would survive. There's no reason for, for it to, to go extinct, at least in a deterministic model. But uh, if we don't make those assumptions, then the population can go extinct. And then this would make that capital N will be zero. And if capital N is zero, then we don't have the constraint anymore. Okay, so we wouldn't obtain this Hamilton-Jacobi equation with constraint if there is extinction. Okay, however, when we study this type of uh, situations where we have uh, a dependence on the environment state and an environment state that can have a jump, okay, so we can have a jump of the environment state from one state to, the an to another, then uh, there could be a, um, a very bad, uh, I mean, a, very, a, a catastrophe and the, the environment um, uh, becomes immediately uh, not adapted at all to the population. So the population is uh, very well adapted, maladapted, could be very maladapted to the new environment and it can go extinct. So we have to consider <laughs> this type of situations where we have, uh, where we are considering uh, um, piecewise constant environments. Okay, so this switch may lead to the extinction of the population. And uh, to, to be able to include that, we have to uh, understand uh, what, uh, what happens, um, I mean, in different, uh, depending on the different states of the environment, whether we would have extinction or survival, and it, it is important to uh, identify the precise conditions under which we have extinction or survival, okay? And this is done in, in the postdoc of um, Christel Echegaray, where we have to um, make a fine analysis of what happens, I mean, at the very initial times, before, because 
here is at the time t over epsilon, but at between zero and uh, at a time of order one over epsilon, we should follow the different uh, uh, traits to see how they grow and uh, to understand whether the population will go extinct or not. Okay? But it is possible to do that. And we have some precise conditions to, to do that, to, 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 uh, to identify extinction or survival. But I'm not going to the, to the details of that. Um, because, uh, uh, okay, it's, uh, I, uh, I think that would be a little bit uh, too uh, technical for, for now. <coughs> but um, let's... Uh, uh, for the moment, assume that, okay, we are in a situation where um, uh, we know, for instance, that we have survival, okay? Another thing to, um, to clarify is that, okay, so we said that the spore of n is included in the zeros of u, but can we identify the zeros of u? And this is actually a... Um, uh, in the time-dependent case, it is not as easy uh, to identify the solutions uh, when uh, um, uh, of the Hamilton Jacobi equation uh, in the transitory dynamics. Okay, but and in general, it is not uh, an easy. Uh, um, it, we cannot prove in a general context that this set has a single maximum point. Okay, so this is a, uh, we know that it is generically true, so in most of the times, almost all the times, but some very uh, symmetric situations, we know that this set has a unique maximum point, <laughs> but we're not uh, able to prove it in a very uh, general context. Okay, but there is a context where we can do it, and um, it is when we, sup we assume that R and U epsilon naught are strictly concave functions. Okay, so just uh, recall that U is the solution to this Hamilton Jacobi equation. Okay. And now we are assuming that R is a concave function with respect to z, and that uh, u0 is also concave with respect to z. So u0 is the initial state. Okay? So if we make these two assumptions, we can indeed prove that u will be a, conc a strictly concave function. And it will be smooth, so it will be very nice in this case, okay? And um, uh, okay, so when first of all, it has a strict, uh, it is a strictly concave function, and a strictly concave function has a unique maximum point, okay? So if u is a strictly concave function, it has a unique maximum point that we will call z bar of t. And um, so this would imply that uh, this set has a unique point, okay? <coughs> so which would mean that the phenotypic density will be concentrated at this point. Moreover, um, the solution will be smooth and we can derive the differential equation on the position of uh, this dominant trait Z bar, okay? We can be described, but z bar dot of t would be equal to the second derivative of u inverse times gradient of r. And actually, in this case, it's a very nice situation where d to u ha has a real um, um, a meaning, a classical meaning. Okay, so it exists. And uh, we can write this equation on z bar, which is very convenient because then we can say that how uh, this dominant trait uh, evolves. Okay? And... Uh, Something that, uh, so these are uh, the properties that uh, 
I mean, they don't need, uh, I mean, d they have been uh, derived in the first uh, papers of this uh, theory and they d are not really related to this jump of the uh, uh, s environment state. It is once we know that we are in this particular state, then we have these properties. And maybe some, uh, I can ma s uh, say some words also about the uniqueness of this type of equation the solution to this type of equation. Um, okay, so in the case where we have a competition term like this, it is not very difficult uh, to, to show the uniqueness of the problem, but of course the uh, constraint is very important. Uh, so you have the uniqueness because of the constraint and you can see this N of t as a Lagrange multiplier which is associated with this uh, maximum of u equal to zero. Okay, so it, is, it has to be chosen in a way such that maximum of u is equal to zero. But when we consider more, uh, more complex uh, um, gross rates, more, com more complex competition terms, then the, the, uh, the question is not uh, trivial at all. So let's forget about E because it doesn't have an importance at this level. And uh, you can have uh, just a function of Z and capital N where R is a decreasing function with respect to N. Then this hamilton jacobi equation with constraint still has a unique solution. But um, the unique problem is not trivial. So in some particular forms of R, it was proved by Bal and Pertam in 2008, but it was very restrictive. It was more situations where we are close to this case. And um, then um, the uniqueness was proved in this uh, context of concave functions. So under concave, concave, concave framework, uh, we proved it by a bit, uh, together with Jean-Michel Rogjoff huh? in 2016. But then in a more general framework, uh, it was proved by um, Vincent Calvez and Adrian Lam. Okay, I, 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 I'm not sure where, uh, when it's really got published. It's around tw uh, tw is tw 20? 21. 21, okay. okay. In tw 21, and um, and it is important. Uh, so when we, we, uh, of course, I didn't talk about uh, the derivation of this uh, time-dependent Hamilton-Jacobi equation, and uh, it is uh, somehow more uh, difficult uh, than the case of stationary state because now we have a function an epsilon that depends on time that uh, we have to prove that it converges to some function n. In the stationary case, only, uh, we had just constants that it, it is enough that they are bounded uh, to, for them to converge. But uh, to have the convergence of this integral no local terms, there's more difficulties. And in usually we prove it in the, um, in the almost every verse sense. And we prove that uh, the limit is uh, of bounded variation. Okay? So this is um, generally, um, I mean, this uh, integral term generally adds some difficulties to the problem that can be handled in this homogeneous environment case, but when we have more complex situations where we have, for instance, spatial heterogeneity and stuff, then uh, this no local term bothers uh, more and more. Okay, so it, 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 is, it is difficult to obtain uh, regularity estimates on this no local term. Okay, but uh, it is important that uh, the uniqueness is true if we assume that uh, 
this function n is bv. So this is important, this is uh, uh, an important uh, property. Okay, so this was just some hysterical, uh, historical uh, results on these type of problems. Let's go back uh, to our problem with uh, environmental switch. So we know that in the case of concave, function, uh, concave framework, we can actually describe the, the dynamics of this dominant trait. And uh, we can actually, so let's consider this particular case where we can say many things and uh, consider it in the case of uh, this, const this uh, piecewise constant environment. Okay, so what, when, what can we say in this situation? In this situation is we say that as long as the population persists, then it will concentrate at the point at bar of t and this at bar of t uh, we follow the environment gradient, okay? Environment, the gradient of the, the growth rate, okay? So, and this is actually, it comes from this, uh, this uh, uh, equation. If you multiply this by gradient of R, because minus D2U uh, uh, inverse, because U is a concave, strictly concave function, this term will have a sign, okay? So just, uh, what we will have is that we actually have this equation, and from this equation we know that the z bar will follow the gradient of the environment. Okay? But then, uh, now let's suppose that we have a switch at this uh, particular, at a particular time, uh, t naught, and we are switching from the state e1 to e2, then the population will go extinct if we have that R of E2 and Z bar is less than zero. Okay, so this is actually easy criterion because we have our, we know already that the population is is uh, a Dirac mass, and uh, so the condition becomes very easy, and we see that okay, if it is if the population is concentrated around the point where its growth rate is negative uh, in the new environment. <coughs> then uh, it is very maladapted and we will have uh, extinction. Okay, I'm not going to detail the precise result bit because the, the, um, what we mean really by extinction can be uh, different if we are at a critical point or not. But let's just uh, have this in mind that, okay, if the, the trait is adapted to the environment such that it has a growth rate, it will survive, otherwise it will uh, it will go extinct. And then once it survives at an initial time, then it will follow the environment uh, gradient, so it will become better and better, and it will not uh, go extinct during uh, the period where the environment does not switch. Does not switch. Okay, so now let's consider a, a simple example where we have two uh, environment states. And at each uh, state, we have a, um, we have a quadratic uh, growth rate where the uh, optimal trait is different. So at a state one, the optimal trait is m at minus theta, and at uh, state two, it is at uh, theta. So the blue curve corresponds to state two, and the red curve corresponds to, the to state one. And now, if we consider a um, period of switch between these two states, which is of O of 1, which will correspond to the first examples that we studied, then, um, then the population will be uh, somehow adapt to, um, to, um, to, an, to the average environment. Okay, so, um, so here is we have done still things in this with this scaling, but with a with small t tilde. And we see that, okay, we'll go a little bit to the right, we go a little bit to the left, but uh, we, uh, the phenotypic density um, remains concentrated around the point z bar, which is the point that maximizes the average growth rate. Okay? So we have, uh, I mean, the population concentrates around the point, which maximizes the average, average growth rate. But now if we take 
t tilde larger, then the population can be remain for a long time in one of the states and it can uh, become more and more adapted to this environment. So let's say that at the beginning we are here, we remain for a long time in this environment, so we will follow this gradient and maybe we will become very close to this optimal trait. But now we, are, we have a very bad growth rate in the, first, in the second state and now we make the switch. We make the switch and we see that, okay, we, this is not good. The population cannot survive and it will go extinct. Okay, so this would be a, a way to, uh, to um, kill, the, uh, kill the population. Okay, so we see that uh, these uh, uh, scale of these uh, fluctuations can have uh, an important impact on, uh, on the outcome. Okay? Okay, so uh, it's almost time, so I will stop here, and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, CPD. Are there any questions? So wh what we saw at the end it was that basically if you specialize too much, then if there's a sudden shift in, mm -hmm. in the environment, you die off. Um, what happens, uh, could you give an interpretation to uh, what happens if the environment is rapidly varying? Like mm -hmm. does this just increase the diffusion? What mm -hmm. happens with T getting small, basically? Capital um, T. <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, actually, I'm not sure I, uh, what would happen. This is an interesting question to, uh, to study. I know that uh, in this uh, work of um, Grégoire Nadin and uh, Cécile, uh, Cé um, okay, so I have, um, sorry, um, Cécile Carrère, c'est bon, oui, <laughs> uh, they studied somehow this uh, situation where the fluctuations are fast, but this was in another context and they were interested in different uh, questions. Uh, but at least maybe you, you could find some, they, they studied it in uh, it's, it's this type of problems in uh, the context of uh, um, uh, cancer uh, therapy and optimization. And, um, but the, I mean, but the, uh, problem was different, but uh, okay, so I have to think about it. I don't know uh, what would be, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I prefer not to answer to it and, and uh, especially that I, I mean, I think that everybody knows now that I really need some vacation, so I, I don't think that what, whatever I think now would be a, uh, a good, uh, <laughs> good idea. <laughs> Other question? So, so as you said, uh, when uh, the, the population is uh, uh, very well uh, uh, selected, mm -hmm. so somehow it's less uh, adapted to yeah. some changes. Mm -hmm. So, and it seems that it is very similar to the experiment that you have. The the population which is uh, well trained to the Temperature 31 degrees, somehow is, uh, okay, is probably, uh, and okay, somehow the other population is uh, uh, the one which is uh, trained for the varying uh, temperature. Yeah. Yeah. At the end, it's uh, even more effective. I mean, uh, the mm -hmm. growth rate yeah. is, uh, is higher. Mm -hmm. So it seems to go at least in the same direction. It, uh, it goes in the same direction for these two cases. Yeah. Actually, uh, I mean, this is uh, actually what you expect um, at the beginning. You say, you say that, okay, a population that has evolved in 31, it is specializes to 31, so it has to be very good in 31, but probably not very good for 24 and 38. 
But a population that has a temperature between 24 and 38, then it is not specialized, it's a generalized. Yeah. And uh, so we expect that it would be do better in temperature 24 and 38. Yeah. So this is uh, yeah. actually intuitive, but not at temperature 31. But for that one, uh, with your model, can you somehow explain this with the S bar and S of yes. E bar? I mean, in some sense where the uh, strength of selections uh, changing with temperature, maybe you, you can Yeah, explain. this is what uh, yeah. I tried to, okay. to show is that indeed if you, um, I mean, if you, you select differently with these tem different temperatures, then if the average uh, se uh, selection is stronger in this case, finally you're not getting generalized, you're getting specialized because your optimal trait is not moving at all. But uh, it's just that it is a nonlinear effect and then you can specialize things and uh, then it, this could explain this uh, situation, yes. Okay, other questions? I, I had a question also in this context of mm -hmm. uh, sweet, uh, periodic environment. Could you combine uh, both the modification of the optimal trait and the uh, selection yes. uh, which is e narrow? E and do you have any parameters to, to have the same result uh, as in this, uh, in this experiment? Uh, oh, if I can, I mean, I haven't, um, uh, okay, what's, uh, what you will generally see is that uh, this, um, the fluctuations on the optimal trait will always be, uh, have a, a negative okay. effect, okay. but uh, this could be uh, in the w one way or another and this will be a mixture of these uh, effects and uh, whether on which one of them will win Okay. Then you would it will determine your outcome. But yeah, you can uh, so you just take any ad, any function r yeah. that you want. And actually, very general. You can also make uh, fluctu your fluctuations on different parameters, other parameters again, even on r. And then uh, you can. Uh, it's just uh, you know it's uh, simple computations to obtain these formula, and you can obtain uh, what you want. I just concentrated on these particular examples to see directly the effect, but you can combine them. Yes. Other questions? Uh, I have just uh, another one. Uh, in fact, I was wondering in this um, uh, off call uh, transformation, and then you take epsilon goes to zero, you always have to, to first prove that n epsilon goes to n in some sense before uh, taking uh, u epsilon goes to u, or you are doing the both at the same time. I didn't get really well. Uh, yeah, well, it depends. It depends. Okay. No, sometimes you cannot. Uh, I, I mean, you can have these type of uh, problems in much more complex uh, situations, where actually you cannot prove that an epsilon <coughs> converges, and, and sometimes it doesn't converge uh, strongly. It just converges weakly, and it can have oscillations. But uh, somehow, sometimes we manage to prove the convergence of u without uh, using the convergence of n and obtain some results uh, still in that. But in this particular situation, we first prove that an epsilon converge and then u epsilon okay. converge, but uh, it's not always the case. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, so we'll have, uh, do you have an announcement? An announcement before we can say <laughs> Yeah, yes. <laughs> Sorry. So thank you for your for your class, uh, Cepide. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>